Laura, you're pretty good at surfing, aren't you? I'm not bad. My first national title I got when I was 14. So um, what age group was it? Was that just... It was... That was for under 14. 14-year-olds or for... Yeah, no, no, under 14s. Uh, yeah. Um, and then the following year... I was 15. Sorry, you got, you got the under 14s when you were 14. You must have got that when you were 13. Sorry, it, yeah, 13. Yeah, no, yeah. no, actually I got the under 14s when I was 12. Oh, right. And then I got on the following year or however many years after, yeah. I won the under 14s, under 16s and women's open. All right. It's such a long time ago now. But you, you, so you were <laughs> open champion. You have been yeah. the best female surfer in the United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. For Well, I and I carried on with those titles until I moved to France and started doing the European tour. Um, and I didn't compete in the UK anymore. So Billabong sponsored me when I was 12. What kind of pressure is that when you're 12? Um, it was my dream. I was like a nightmare at Hang school. Hang on, you're 12? You're 12? Yeah, but I think I'd always done loads of sports growing up. I did motocross, horse riding, gymnastics, like swimming. I ran competitively. So I'd done literally all of them um but surfing was the was the one that kind of I felt like I had an escape from I was really struggled at school I wasn't very academic um so it was kind of like my outlet to just yeah that, so, so, I, I, I how, so you're born in Bristol right yeah um it's got some water but not necessarily a lot of surf yeah no <laughs> doesn't the seven once a year have this kind of tidal wave that comes down and people actually do surf that. seven board you get seven really board. sick after it yeah but if have you, you done it no no i've never done it but i've had mates well, that oh, when done you say it. you're sick you mean you get what uh, vials disease or oh something. you just get like ill like you're you're puking for like the next two days if you, you just drink like that we'll come on to actually the environment because i'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that you've traveled to, to enough seas now to notice just how much damage we've, yeah. we've done to our oceans but so there you are you're your UK champion, open UK champion. Did you encounter I mean, all these people that have been there for so many years? All of a sudden, this this young kid comes along. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? She's only yeah. just started a couple of years ago, and now she's open champion. How how were you received? Um, at the start, like definitely at the start of my surfing career, really well. Everyone was like, "Oh, there's like this new girl that's like coming through, like really quickly improving." It was great, and then I think. I was one of the first girls to ever get sponsored by a big brand. So Billabong sponsored me pretty soon on. Um, and then as I started traveling and kind of like making money from surfing, there was definitely a lot of like jealousy and everyone was a little bit more hostile. And I how, kinda, how did that manifest itself? Um, I think because I was, I was also modeling for Billabong. So I was doing all their kids range, like modeling their clothes and stuff, which at that point was like such fun. We'd literally just like rip around on mopeds and like be traveling around and just having photos. How old? Take, 12, 13. That's a lot happening for 12 <laughs> stroke 13. I mean, they are really, really kind of well, like very important years in terms of particularly females' development. They're all pretty important for a male as well, but it sort of happens a bit later generally mm -hmm. for boys, as they say. But so there you are developing really from a girl into a woman, as it were, um, and you're traveling around on scooters, motorcycles, <laughs> surfboards, going to exotic locations and having your photograph taken. I mean, keeping your feet on the ground, literally keeping your feet on the ground. Yeah, trying to when when, when possible. Um, I don't know. I think it had literally been my dream since I first got a surfboard at the age of nine. I knew that was all I wanted. Like I wanted to just do that. And like I said, I hated school and it kind of just... It, yeah, I just want to do that, but that didn't happen for me. <laughs> I mean, I trained a lot. I trained hard and I was, I, I think my dad was a professional athlete and I... So what did your dad do? He was a professional runner. Oh, so right. So around 1,500 metres, yeah. Um, so I'd always had that mentality of if you're going to succeed in something, like it is your, it's your all, you know, of a sport. And dad was never pushy. Mum, they were like, you know, you're like good at your sports and that's great. Um, they always made sure that I was still like doing school bits and stuff like that. But Were they worried about you academically? You, you said you, you, you struggled. As in, I struggled as in, I wasn't the brightest in the class. And for me, I'm so competitive mm -hmm. that if I'm not great at something or like the best, it Are was like, I don't even want to do it. You've had a few of those through the doors. Um, oh yeah, you, if, if you're not going to, if you can't give this thing 100%, yeah, I'm not no, going to no, do no, it. No, no. I'll cut away from that and I'll go and do something else where I can be very successful at it and give it my all. Yeah. Well, I just, my was I enjoyed it so much that I wanted to, I wanted to be the best at something that I really enjoyed, you know. What did, you, what did the kids at school think? Um, it was really weird at school 
because I was already traveling so much so young that we had tutors that traveled with us when we were traveling with Billabong. So they'd kind of like... Well, Billabong sponsored, sponsored t-shirts for you? Not like sponsored t-shirts, but we'd like take work with us. And like we'd have we'd have to do like hours of work while we were away. Like well, who, was, who was tutoring you? So like our team managers would make sure that it was all being done. But they're, because they're like your parents. You travel with them for like six months of the year. So they, they're they literally like your parents and your sisters, like the girls and, and that you travel because with. Because your, your father, as you say, came from a sporting background. He was quite happy and quite, quite sure that you'd be safe in that kind of environment yeah they'd they'd met Billabong, like billabong had been around me since i was like 12 years old so they they have to put in you know they have to put in trust and billabong also on the other side they had to they had to kind of instill that into mum and dad and make sure that they knew like yeah we are taking your daughter like to the other side of the world and she's yeah, gonna be I surfing mean, waves and she's gonna be doing like a lot of dangerous things but you know, I think I have so much respect for my parents because I honestly don't know if I'd be able to do that when I have kids. But for them to just be like, okay, like we've got to let her go. This is like what she, you know, you, we can't stop I, her I doing can understand this. Letting, letting them go when you're about 16. It's, it's a big gap between 12 and 16. For, to be fair, from 12 to 13, I wasn't like full-time traveling. I was backwards and forwards. Like do, right. do, it was, everything was a bit more in Europe. And then we'd have like two or three big trips to Hawaii and Australia every so year. So you've been to Hawaii? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really annoying me. <laughs> Where are the best waves? Mm, for me, like my favorite place surf is Portugal or yeah. uh, Mexico. Is sick. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like quiet. I think it's the vibe of everything. Like the people are super. Whereabouts chill. in Mexico? Um, so Watoku. Don't know. So it's kind of. You'd never go there unless you surfed. It's like that right. kind of vibe. It is. I was, I, I got lost. I was open water once for nine hours in the Baja Peninsula. I don't tell many people. Yeah, the well, it's uh, Baja de la Cruz. Yeah, it's yeah. that same. So you find yeah, the bottom yeah, yeah, of the yeah. pass. It's right there. And yeah. then we got on a yacht like you do. I, have to, I won't tell you how rich this family are, but they're one of the richest families on the planet. And um, they wanted to go um, uh, for open water spearfishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the closest I got to water was going over Albert or Chelsea Bridge, <laughs> right? And in those days, I used to smoke Marlboro Lights, which I hate to this day, the idea of the fact that I ever smoked. I didn't smoke all the time, but I did. So the idea of like emptying my lungs and trying to go down one meter was high, and they were going down like 12 meters and then trying to shoot oh my God. very, very big fish. Anyway, I said to them, I'm going to try and fin back to the boat. I tried to swim nine nautical miles against an outgoing tide, right? There's no one about. They've got special permission to be in this area. The Baja, the actual length of Baja, the actual peninsula that goes inland is the length of Britain. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, I know. We're like, so I'm like, we're, hard, we're in Middlesbrough, right? And I'm trying to get to London, literally. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm trying to do eight miles against the tide. I, I told the bloke on the boat, on the rib, that I would be, if you couldn't, if you couldn't see me, I'd either be on the boat, but look for me on the way back. But I should thought I was so sure that I'd make it back. I can hear them. Bzzz, it's now gone dark, right? <laughs> I've still got my weight belt on, right? I'm so dehydrated. I'm you still get the weight belt on. Nice. Nice. Really Good. clever. Yeah. Really clever. Smart. Yeah. I've still got my spear gun. Oh, why not? Well, you never know. You might That's really handy. Sharp. Well, no, 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 no. But selfish came up past me. And then I've got two seals swimming next to me. Now we know what, who likes to eat seals? Sharks. Great white sharks, yeah, right? Mostly. That place is full of white sharks because it's full of seals. <laughs> and who's the fattest seal in the ocean? <laughs> Kempi. Do you know what? They eventually found me. I was whistling. I was like, going, you know, you, you listen to like props underwater. You're like, bzzz. Yeah. I'm like, oh, whistling, I'm screaming, I'm shouting. When the two guys had got back to the boat, right? My wife, my then wife was on the boat, right? So they, they washed off. They hung up the fish they'd caught. They went downstairs. They all had a kip. They all come back up for dinner, right? Bear in mind, I was gone like seven, eight hours, right? Right? They all sit down for dinner, right? And they're like going, oh, Ross and, Ross and his wife had an argument. So obviously he's staying in his cabin. So they only get to the main course before they go. So Ross started eating then. I thought Ross was out with you. I thought he was still out in the boat. Uh -uh. Oh, my God. No, he found no. me. <laughs> Obviously, they found me. Otherwise, I would still be, I'd be shark food. Or, anyway, that was my boring story. For so today. you're great, good, at, good swimmer then. I've got a lot of buoyancy. Let's put it that way. Well, not with that <laughs> weight belt. <laughs> Keep the weight belt on. What was that about? Weirdo. Real weird. But anyway, going there. So, so Mexico is best for you. Yeah. 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 And 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 you know, tell me on your travels around the world. And 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 I've travelled a little bit as well. Um, you know, I've just noticed in the in the twenty five years that I, you know I was making docs, I have been making docs, is that just just the filth 
in our oceans. I mean, I did one. I did a film about piracy. So, you know, we're in the um, uh, Bight of Benin. Um, we went up to Malacca Strait. The amount of plastic mm. in the in the oceans is it's, just shocking, yeah, isn't it? Do you not think that all those big companies, and I just want to aim at Billabong, but all those big surf companies and all those all those kind of marine type sports companies, they should be doing something a bit more? It's like it's honestly been a battle. We should all be for, doing a bit more. Yeah, no, for sure. Um I lived in Bali for two and a half years. I moved back in two thousand or twenty one, so yeah, three years ago, four years ago. Um and it's been a massive issue for years, obviously. They they hide it so well for such, well, they hid it for so long for, you know, just to kind of make Bali look beautiful and make sure people were coming in and doing mm. tourism and, you know, kind of building the country up, which now it's booming and like tourism is amazing and they're really thriving. Um, but then the ocean plastic, you kind of, you can't hide from anymore. You can't not see it. I was literally there two weeks ago and every single time I go back, you see it more and more and more. And on the surface of everything, they're hiding it, you know, in like these nice bougie new restaurants. You don't see anything. And if you go out to the back of it, they, you know, there's plastic, plastic yeah. everywhere. But they're in the front being like, oh, but we use bamboo straws. Yeah, yeah. You know, so there's like a real like miscommunication between like the tourism and then the actual like local people because. But when also I they're going to go for the cheapest option. Which well, yeah, is for often sure. Plastic, right? and, but. It will always be the cheapest option for them right now. But when I was, I went into a few schools when I lived there and we kind of tried to, you know, teach them at the at the start because it's a generation thing. You know, if you're going in and telling parents to go and do this, they're like, well, we've been doing this for years, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, but and if also, you go who, and who tell are you kids, to tell me? Yeah. So um, we went in and we were kind of, you know, trying to just give them just more information because I feel like that's something that they lack so much. Mm. Um, and... There, there has been a massive difference, you know, like the, the governments there have been putting more recycling and they are doing more, but it's it's the it's the rubbish coming in from elsewhere, you know. They're, they're obviously creating a lot, but it's all coming in from like so many different places. And But would you say that in the time, and you've been doing this for, for, for some years now, you know, travelling around the world, spending a lot of time in oceans, in yeah. different oceans, that you've seen an increase, personal increase? Massively. Even um, last Christmas, or this Christmas just gone, Mum and I were walking at the in the beach in Devon, and it was really sad actually. There was um, two little girls on the beach just walking with their mum with a little bucket, and um, they were like picking bits up. And when me and mum walk on the beach with the dog, we always pick bits of litter up and just you know yeah. bits you can see like big bits. Um, and these two young girls were like kind of like sif sieving through the sand. So I like walked over and I was like, oh, we like thought they were looking for shells. And they were sieving through and getting all the tiny little, they're called balls. nerdles, like the little mini, balls. like my, like tiny plastics. And they made, they were making like sandcastles and like bits like that. And they were playing around. And I said to mum, I was like, because we used to go there every weekend as kids and make sandcastles there. And it was crazy. It was like, they were making sandcastles and they were kind of like dotted with like little like plastic bits. And I said to my mum, like, it, you never used to visually see it, you know, like it's there, it's everywhere. Like you literally look through the sand and not see like a patch with like all these little like dots in. Um, so even like on my home beach in the UK, which is meant to be like blue flag beach and like really mm. clean and like fantastic. Even there, you know, like we're, we're, you can't get away from it now. Like the, every, like the fish are eating it, the birds are eating it. Like, every, like they're dying from these things and it's on our doorstep. Like, we, like there is no hiding from it now. Mm. Um, but do you think there's enough being done about it? No, but you know, for I was like coming out of, I did Love Island and I came out of there and you get offered all of these crazy clothing deal brands and it's a lot of fast fashion, which I point blank have always said no to. And I cannot just because of what I believe in and my environmental beliefs, it just, it doesn't, it, you know, I'd be a massive hypocrite to take so the did money. Did you turn down a lot of cash? Though? Oh yeah. It, that was the hardest thing was like <laughs> well, something that about you that, really yeah. believe in like really like my hand on my heart like it really like yeah, upsets yeah. me like a lot you know this is like mm -hmm. the ocean gave me everything I have kind of thing go back to Love Island though so you, you the first time you were offered it you turned it down right yeah why'd you turn it down um I think I'd gone through a few like mental health kind of struggles when I finished competing and like during mm -hmm. um and then I kind of, I went, I moved back to Portugal and just had like a two years of like regrouping, like figuring out like next move, whether I was going to either go back to competing um, or whatever I was going to do next. I kind of sat there and chatted to my manager that first year and I was like, no, maybe this year I go back to, maybe I go back to competing 
or maybe I just don't want to do like maybe I just want to like make a surf school and just teach lessons at the beach that is a nice option can I oh yeah no it's still there don't worry (laughs) can I come Um, yeah yeah definitely I've always wanted to learn to surf but let's go back so so you you said no first time because why I just wasn't I just didn't think I was ready yeah and I knew it was gonna be a massive thing and I'd always said to myself if I was ever gonna go on such like a big platform it's the biggest, I needed one to of the biggest know reality shows exactly. particularly for your age group isn't it yeah. yeah I needed to know exactly who Laura Crane was I knew I wasn't like those other girls and I wasn't like glam and like cute and like doing all those like girly bits so well, you're a like, model you're a good looking lady but I was always like an athletic model like yeah, I yeah, was, sure. you know so for me it was making sure that no matter what anybody said about me when I came out or when I was in there that I was like you know what I don't care because like this is me and I'm proud of me and I, I've gone on there to be something different so the first time you said no because of that then yeah. what made you to say yes the second time um I just in Portugal like surfing every day and I think because I wasn't really doing much in that year And I'd been like seeing other people kind of like go into that show and like come out and just all do kind of like very similar things, which is fab. Like some people have got like amazing careers out of it and they've done so well. But I think I really struggled in seeing that there was no one on there for kind of like 15 year old Laura to like when I was going through like all my changes and stuff. And, you know, I was like a massive tomboy. There was no one really for like 15 year old Laura to look up to in that show that Mm. I felt. Um, So I just, yeah, I I kind of wanted to go in and just be like, hey, like you can have broad shoulders, like you can be in the pool all day. Like you don't have to like brush your hair and like and do all the curling bits and like makeup. I've rolled that out of my life. You know? Well, yeah, no, you're you're fine. You got it easy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So yeah, no, it was just I just wanted to go in there and kind of be something different and yeah, inspire girls that yeah got a bit confused. Did you did you you do that? Do you think? Yeah, I. I had honestly like coming out of there so many messages from girls being like how many like hun- like thousands thousands, thousands. And even now you know like they see a surf video and they're like wow it's so nice that, you know just to see mm. a girl like go out and like do their thing and be like strong and like powerful and you know not cow down in like a male dominated sport and those is it male, how, how male dominated is it crazy <laughs> like, so it's all about blokes yeah. right yeah but also I, I mean could not a woman be as good as a bloke at that sport? I mean, it's one of the things where you possibly could do because it's your ability yeah, to sure. to hit the right wave, surely. I think it, a lot of the time it comes down to like power, as in like like physical strength, strength. Um, which is is what makes... Because surfing is about... The criteria of like a wave is to surf a wave with speed, power and flow and like technicality. So the more power you have in like your body the faster you go so usually guys will be a more powerful um surfer but that's not to say that you know these girls are like pushing all the boundaries like they're surfing waves that are like how tall, you know, how tall? i think maya last year did like a f- i think she did like 80 feet oh get out of here yeah and 80 she, feet and dude, this chick is like beautiful and she like walks down the beach puts on her vest and she's like out there with, where's with she all from the boys. she's where's from she? brazil right 80 um, feet mm-hmm. are, are this, are these are kind of waves that people get towed up, towed up yeah. to yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And whereabouts are the 80 foot waves this one was in nazare so it's like an uh, hour and an, an hour and a half is it? Is it no, no 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 in portugal an hour and a half. i don't even know where that is yeah so 80 foot waves in portugal yeah between um porto and lisbon on that on that like coast yeah. So chicks are doing it like they're going for it. Is the sponsorship different? So I, you know, for instance, in tennis, we do know that, you mm-hmm. know, and in many other sports, you know, where women compete in different areas, that the, the, the sponsorship is less. If you're a man, yeah, uh, well, I think Federer earns more money than a Williams, even though they're, they're probably quite both well off. They're not worrying about, yeah, yeah, no, they're about whether fine. they're paying, paying, <laughs> they're paying, paying for the holiday next year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, when I first started surfing, girls were doing things to look like boys. We were wearing long board shorts, we were wearing like long t-shirts and we were trying to be like the boys. Mm-hmm. And then actually it was my generation of surfing that Instagram came in when we were 15 and our sponsor said, okay girls, because you're model, you model for the brand and you're like marketable, but you also compete and you're professional athletes. You have two sides of your contract. So you're, you know, one is your one is you being an athlete, and the other one is you being a model. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But we didn't give like the modelling bit was kind of you know part and parcel. We did it to keep Billabong happy, but we were athletes. Like that was like what we grew up doing and loving. 
And then Instagram kind of came in and we started wearing like shorter shorts and like more bikinis. And then all of a sudden we were like, you know what? We sunbathed in the, on the beach in a bikini. So why don't we just surf in our bikinis? And it was a, it was well, a- Mainly because it's freaking cold if you're trying to do that. Oh in, yeah, well uh, I wasn't Nuki. living here. <laughs> um, and then there was a massive shift because all of a sudden we had like the girls that were competing against us that maybe weren't so marketable and like weren't doing the modeling mm. and like weren't so like putting themselves out there kind of thing. Um, was were getting really jealous because we were getting bigger more, sponsorship more attention, deals more, and kind of things money, like that. Even though they might be better surfers, yeah? And then it kind of crossed into the competitive and into the competitive side being like, oh, that judge only gave you that because you're cute and like you're hot and they fancy you. So it, it all kind of like merged into Did it get nasty? Like, Oh, surfing got bitchy. Imagine you're Go all like traveling to, I wanna, together. I want to hear it. All right. So I traveled with five girls, um, like Billabong, like my Billabong team. It was me, an American girl, a Hawaiian and two Australians. We were like sisters. We had like all the same clothing, the same brand. So we'd literally pack up, leave Hawaii and it would all go into like like a suitcase. Just yeah, like yeah, chuck yeah. it in. It, we call it the floor drobe because mm. everywhere we'd arrive, we'd literally just like on floor, the floor drobe it. Yeah. Um, but we'd still manage to have arguments about like one piece of clothing. They're like, that was mine. I'm like, we've all got the same shit. Like, chill. I wouldn't say it never got nasty because you're your family. You travel together the whole time. I'll tell you what, it gets but nasty with my family occasionally. <laughs> there was, you know, the hardest thing was is your sisters, you're traveling, you're like all your bits that you're going through, you're growing up, you're like in your, you know, yeah. fundamental years of like changes. Um, the hardest thing I think was they're your best mates and you're your sisters, but they're also your competitors. Predators, yeah. So that's an old one, isn't it? Yeah, that was really tough. So you're training together every single day in the sea, out of the water, and then you're eating dinner, you're like doing all the things, you're hanging out that's as like really mates, close, isn't you're it? traveling together. The whole, Literally for nine months of the year, we traveled on tour together. Um, and yeah, I don't know how we're still mates now. <laughs> Are you still mates now? Yeah. yeah. So so you've, you've been through all that, but you said you talked about, you know, we, we have on this podcast we talk about toughest moments and I know you're, you're 25 but you have had a few haven't you what was the toughest um I think kind of making the decision whether to stay in my sport and you know potentially go back into the mental um kind of like areas that I was in that I really struggled um or just to say, you know what, I'm just going to do something new and I'm going to put everything into it and I'm going to do something completely new. I think that for a professional athlete that's, you know, never really gone to like college or uni or, you know, it's all I'd ever known. You can um, still do, do that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh God, I'm good on it. But <laughs> but then what I'm saying is where are you, you know, you see your mental health. Mm. I mean, give me an example of where you were. So... Obviously, like I said, I was a model, but I was also a professional athlete. Mm. So I was making money from modeling, but also, you know, the thing that I lived for was my sport mm. um, and trying to, you know, at the age of 16, trying to balance those two body types that I thought I was meant to have. So on one side of the spectrum, I thought I was meant to be this like skinny model because I was with Models One in London as well at the time. So I was shooting like for other brands and stuff. And then on the other side of it, I had to be as strong as possible because I was a professional surfer and I was, you know, mm -hmm. surfing these waves and doing all these things. So I think that balance of like not really knowing like how I or who I was meant to be or like did was I meant to be what Billabong wanted me to be as like an athlete or did they want me to be more a model? And then Instagram. Were you being came pulled by those all, two different forces? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then oh, when I, I say that, I mean not just sorry, were you being pulled by those different forces? And I don't necessarily mean because you wanted to be good at one or be good at the other. Were there actual people saying you've got to look like this and you've got to behave like that? Yeah. So at a very kind of youngish age, you've got dominant factors in your life pulling you north and south. Mm -hmm. Well, this is when they all kind of, like I said, with like the Instagram and social media, when that kind of all came in, they used to use their athletes for all the modelling stuff and all like their kind of... Um, Mm. Uh, Endorsement. Yeah, well, no, like the um, like the photo shoots for like the catalogue and all that kind of stuff, mm. and like the billboards was all athletes and girls on surfboards, and then it kind of switched as kind of social media came in, and they wanted to perceive this like new kind of surf girl because before every like surf girls, if you look at surf girls in like I don't know mid nineties, they're like you know blokes, Blok. like they're big big girls, and um. 
they're like you know trying to look like the guys they wanted to be like men they wanted to prove themselves to the boys and then it kind of had that shift and then I think when it had that shift we were all a bit like oh my god okay so now they're using skinny models to do the job we used to do and that had an effect on you mentally. Oh, massive all five of us and you know the craziest thing was because we were sisters but competitors I had I had really bad bulimia one of the other girls had like basically didn't eat and the other the other two had like really suicidal thoughts was depressed and we never spoke about it until about a year ago um just so even because though you were it there, was weakness you know could proceed. So yeah. talk about, let's talk about uh bulimia um do you know what i mean, we were looking this up just now it looks like twice as many people over the last seven years have ended up in a hospital with eating disorders yeah do you would you would you say that's something that you find shocking or do you just no, think, I think, that, I think that's the way things are going? Do you think social media plays a part? In massively, that? massively. You're, it's a con you're basically flicking through and just comparing the whole time. And even now, you know, I've had my struggles and I see myself comparing myself to other people. I'm like, Laura, why? Like, why, why are we, in f why, so why does social media, and when we're using it here now, I'm hopefully using it um, to be entertaining and informing, why does it create such, comp such competition in terms of body shape? Because the thinner you are, the more attractive you are, the more successful you are. Is that it? I don't know. I think it all goes in trends, doesn't it? You had first you had the Kardashians and they were all about having a big bum and a small waist and big boobs, mm -hmm. which realistically is, is all an unattainable goal unless you've had surgery and like you've got a trainer that trains you like three times a week and does it like, you know, to fit your body type. People can't afford these kinds of things, you know. Yeah. But why does it why does the bod the body shape on social media create so many issues for so many young people who, who, who who's who's influencing it is it fashion or is it actually the people on social media no it's, it's the influencers the influencers are there photoshopping half the time yeah everything well, is now photoshopped on instagram so you're using this app and it takes you what 10 minutes at home however long it takes you to photoshop something and then you've got these young imper like impressionable girls that are sat at home being like oh my god how am i meant to look like that you can't what would you say if someone's listening to this now and they're um, they're bulimic? What would you say <sighs> to get help straight mm. away? I think as soon as I told my parents and well, they actually found out, but as soon as they knew, you know, there's such easy, simple ways to get better, um, and it's a, it's not easy. It's not overnight, and it's you keep working and you fail once. You but fail you, what twice. you're saying is that like, like for many things, for many issues, whether it be a di of any addiction, really, mm -hmm. is the first step and the hardest step is to start talking about it. To for sure, one hundred percent. And even you know, I've relapsed and I've had you know times when it's come back and it's embarrassing, especially for somebody like me who's like quite competitive with themselves. It feels like failure when you relapse. But the most important thing is when you relapse is to speak about it again mm. and not just be like, oh, because it's really easy, I think, with these kinds of things to speak in past tense and kind of say, I used to have bulimia. I used to struggle with mental health to mentally make you feel like you're better, but actually you're just covering it up again. So I think the most important times are when you first kind of address it and you've spoken about it once mm. is to, when you do relapse, because it, you know, I personally think bulimia for me is something that in a way I will always carry with me, the thoughts. The reason that I, like that my bulimia got so bad was because it was a control thing. I was living such a transient life. I was mm -hmm. kind of, one day I was in Hawaii, next day I was flying to Oz. Then which to so most people and, listening to this sounds absolutely idyllic, yeah. but actually it is no, a No, no, especially for like a kid when you're that age, not even knowing where you're going to be tomorrow night, where you're going to sleep, you what country them. you're going to. Well, they knew. They knew like two days before, but then they weren't sure like what flight we were going to be on, all those kinds of things. So I think the bulimia is like a control thing. You, when your life is so kind of everywhere and like Chaotic, stressful, yeah. this it was, was something this that thing you that, could that I do could that you could control. Eat, purge, like so you eat like a lot and then you like vomit and you kind of have this, it's really weird, but you have this sense of like, okay, I'm in control of just this one thing. So everything else can seem so kind of out of control and crazy, mm. but you have control over this one small tiny part of your life and it makes you feel but then it starts to control everything else because you then start not wanting to eat in certain places and you know that you've got to make sure that you find a toilet to go to straight after you've eaten and it it very very quickly overtakes kind of anything else so you say it's it's a sort of it's, it was something that you could control yourself in a sea of chaos this was the one thing that you you had control yeah. of and how did you get over it 
Or you say you never get totally over anything, yeah, I yeah. guess. Um, my, I'm really close to my family, even though I'd obviously travelled for a long time. They'd, you know, we're, we are a really close family. Mm. I would always call and we chat. Um, and my, I was living in Bali at the time when I was at my illness, when it, it got quite dangerous. And dad literally called me. He was like, you're on the next flight home. Or the rise, I'm, I'm coming there. I'm, I'm coming to get you. And that was it. I literally like packed my bags from Bali. And I think it was the, that flight home literally was the worst. What was it? Tell me. <laughs> Just sitting there and being like, wow, I actually have to confront this for the first time in my tell, life. I'm, I'm going to talk, have to talk about this. Yeah, this to my now. mom and my dad. I think that was like really hard for me. How old? I was 21. So I'd had it from 16 <sighs> till 21. And so, I, so you've been doing that for five years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like puking like six times a day. Like, it's also going to hurt your insides, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. burn you. Oh, the, the like effects that it had on, on the body. I didn't have a period for, for like three and a half years. And... It, you you know, this thing that scared me most was when I was just leaving Bali, I was so stressed that I literally just didn't eat for like almost a week. What? Yeah. And you... St- I've like done your, three days. Yeah. I did three days without food once. And honestly... And training. I was still I, surfing. No, man. Like, I wasn't training. I was yeah, just yeah, trying... Yeah. It was in a very hot climate and there was just no food. But... Shoot. Sorry. Yeah. Crazy. A week without food. but And also because you're surrounded by it as well. I mean, the reason I didn't eat food was because there was no food. yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, that f- literally that flight home, and I was like, "Wow, I'm actually gonna have to sit down with my parents and be like, yeah, I've hidden this for you from f- for five years.' I just didn't want them to feel like by them letting me go and like live my dream and do the thing that I love that they'd kind of failed and that they'd made a mistake because I knew that's I knew that's how they'd f- you know that mm. how they'd feel like that's they'd blame it on that's themselves. How parents always feel. Yeah, so that was really really hard, and I think you know the moment it was was seeing well, my hopefully dad. Hopefully, that's how parents should yeah, feel. Yeah. yeah. Seeing my dad sat on the end of my bed and literally say to me, like crying, and like, my dad, like, he's not a big cry. Like, no, he's like, a me fresh and my athlete, dad, like, right? Yeah, Go yeah. Cheers. And like, not much emotion between like me and my dad. Like, he's my like idol. But um, seeing him sat there and crying, and he was like, I'm not letting, he was like, I'm not letting you do this. You know, like, he was, told me, he was like, it's not fair on like us. And also, I'm, I will not let you sit there and like just kill yourself. Like, it's, it's selfish. Mm. And I was like, Okay, yeah, because I thought this was all about me. And the moment that I realized it, it was like affecting other people and it kind of took all the pressure like off me a little bit in a weird way. And well, I was well, like, because you're, well, you're actually it, coming clean, aren't well, you? Well, yeah. And then so I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this for them because I had such little self worth at that moment. I was like, so I there don't you care. are. But you, so you, so you, you've been a national champion, you're competing European, you're, you know, the billabong lady. And you've got no self-esteem. Yeah, zero on the floor, like literally nothing. Um, Which for most people, including myself, sounds. Oh, ridiculous. me too. Even now, bonkers. Like when I look back, I'm like, how? Like how did Bill you get bonkers? There? Yeah, exactly. Called, yeah? <laughs> um, but yeah, then slowly, I, I mean, I spent a long time like read like a million self-help books and really just rebuilt my personality because I had nothing. I was literally like this walking eating disorder. I had there was no aspect of like. Laura anymore like this fun bubbly girl that I was when I was you know growing up and doing these things it just kind of disappeared and my mum she said to me she was like it was so sad like you didn't laugh for ages and it was really weird to like have you at home and like because usually when I'd go home I'd like kind of fake it and be like oh yeah fine yeah, yeah, sure. um, and then yeah literally just rebuilding my personality like back and kind of molding myself into how I wanted to be as a person and it sounds really weird but I knew this like Mexican kid from like growing up and he had this kind of personality where he'd walk into any room and he could just light it up and I was like I want to be like that and I remember speaking to my therapist and she said you have you have the capability to do that this is your life you can be who you want to be if you want to if you want to be like the person that you know can light up a room but also by doing that you have to also make sure that you're not doing it for other people because I think that was always a really easy thing for me to do was like kind of fake it and like be like the life of the party and really, really happy to like kind of hide how I was actually feeling. Um, but yeah, it was, the recovery was the one of the hardest things in my life was having bulimia, but I'm so grateful for the journey that I had from it. Do you get a lot of people on social media talking about it to you who have got it or are you helping people in a way I'm um about, i'm just talking about it now you're helping people yeah yeah no definitely i have especially when i do things like this where i speak about it so openly and i you know my thing is i don't want it it shouldn't be an embarrassing thing no. you know i don't think there was a time when i remember sitting at home being like this is like 
the worst thing. I can't believe anyone's ever going to find out about it. And it was actually the week well, it's after. It's also not like a new condition. Yeah, it's, no, it's, it's been, been around for years. It's been around, well, yeah, for, like for longer. Like, yeah. And I think the less stigma like, around it, the easier it is to get better, the easier it is to talk about it and things mm, like that. And totally. I'm not embarrassed about it anymore. And if I was to relapse tomorrow or next week or in, you know, 10 years, I hope by like by then it's a completely normal thing to speak about and be able to just go and like chat to your mate and be like, oh, I did this, this the that's other what day. You're doing, you know? isn't it? Um, but so we're talking about bulimia, but also you nearly died, didn't you? <laughs> Yeah. All those years of surfing and bloody sepsis got me. Yeah. yeah. Begins with an S. Yeah. <laughs> surfing sepsis. Not it's not the same, sadly. No, it's not. No. <laughs> no. Well, there's some people out there are gonna not know what it is, but it's blood poisoning, isn't it? Extreme yeah. blood poisoning. Yeah, yeah. Go on. So I it was just literally about four months after I came, come I'd come out of Love Island. I was living in Portugal at the time. I went into Love Island, so I'd had to, I actually moved in my manager, I lived with her for three months and I was away from the ocean. I was kind of going out and like drinking with like mates. And then I was also working like every single day. Doing? And just kind of like Modern. the post Love Island bits, like oh, right. all, you know, yeah, yeah. The events or whatever. Um, and I still to this day think that it was purely just like running myself into the ground, a new change of life. I really wasn't enjoying being in London. I'd never, I'd never lived in the UK since I was literally like 15. Mm. So it was like this whole new thing. And I was like, am I, ha am, is this really what I want to do? Like, do I really want to be here? And I think I was kind of just running away from it and just getting, making myself so but, busy. But you, you were over your bulimia at this point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. no, that was, that was gone. Um, but just making myself so busy and like really ran myself down. I got quite ill. And um, mum called me and she said, are you, like, are you okay? You've not like, really messaged me back much. I'm just checking you're okay. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I just got a bit of a cold. Like, I'm just going to chill. And I, I was like, I'm coming on my period. Like, probably just feeling like a bit low. And she was like, look, I'm going to come to London. I'm going to drive to London tomorrow. We're going to go shopping for the day. Have a nice day. And I like, just want to spend like spend mm -hmm. some time with you. I was like, yeah, yeah, like, sounds great. So she drove up to London and I felt horrendous that morning. Like, really, really bad. And I was like, this is a bit weird. So I called mom and I was like, I actually, maybe you might need to take me to the hospital. And for me to say that, I would like never. Like, I would mm. walk around with like broken fingers and like everything for like weeks. And I wouldn't even like flinch at it. And um, she was like, oh, okay, a bit rogue, but fine, we'll go. And I kind of thought I'll get some like antibiotics. I'll be out in like mm. an hour. So they check your temperature and they check your heart rate. And my heart rate was literally through the roof. And I have like a really low resting heart rate mm. anyway. Um, and they said to my mum, they're like, okay, she's septic. And they literally pulled me straight in. And I didn't really know what that was. I was quite delirious at the time and I didn't mm. really figure out what was going on. Um, and next thing but I you've knew- But you've got to be poisoned by something or something inside so you, right? So mine was, the, the scariest thing, the reason why it got so dangerous was because it took them eight days to figure out where the infection was coming from. So it starts from an infection within your body somewhere. It can either be from a cut from like external mm -hmm. or, or your body starts poisoning from itself. Inside, because, yeah. yeah. So at first, because I had like pains in my stomach, they thought it was maybe a kidney infection. Mm -hmm. Then they thought it was an appendix. But for each of those things, they have to try Test. the antibiotics. I really and if it doesn't work, work in 24 hours, they've got to figure out what it is and where it's coming from. So for eight days in there, I was just getting more and more and more and more infected. So your mum's with you? Mum's, yeah, mum's in hospital every day. Um, and I, I'd never slept, I'd never slept in a hospital before in my life. I'd like never been ill at all with mm. like any kind of like yeah, my illness. body, like making myself. And I think that was the weirdest thing. I would like never saw myself as that person in the hospital. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm fit, I'm healthy. Like would, that would never happen to me. Um, and then day nine, my blood infection level was, um, was like two. It was getting worse. Yeah, right? it was like high 200s. And they basically said to, they basically had said to my mum, which she hadn't told me, was it gets to a certain level where the clean blood basically goes to all of your organs, so into your chest, so your limbs at some point, which is why a lot of people have like the amputations, amputations. and things like that. Mm. And I literally, I looked at when she, mum told me, I literally looked at her and I said, mum, I've got no kids. I've had for a 24 year old, I've had like, as far as they go, like a pretty sick life. The thought of me living with with no limbs, that's not a life like for me, you know, like I, I can't I wouldn't be able to make that decision because they kind of said, you know, it gets to that point where you have to 
you like you lose die the limbs or you amputate your... or you die. Yeah, and I was like, or you risk it and you you just carry on the, and yeah. you just hope that you get better before it all kind of like packs in. And I said to mum, there would, there would never be a moment where I'd be like, yeah, okay, like amputate. That's, I couldn't. I think for me mentally, doing like what I've done growing up and as active as I am. I don't think I could have made that deci- like that decision. Well, you know, some, sadly, some people don't have that decision to be able to make. So you're exactly, very awfully lucky. For sure. And, you know, yeah. how quickly they got, honestly, the NHS were incredible. Mm. Like there was days where I felt so, so low and like I could was never going to get better. And I remember like I had to tell mum, like, just go have a walk. Like you go and like have some time. And but this still wasn't. They still hadn't worked. They out still hadn't well. figured out where it was coming from. Your compass. You were able to talk. You were able to communicate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I was. To be, I was quite like alert because I was on so many like painkillers and like literally like filled with like fluids and. But none of the antibiotics were working. They finally like came to me and said, "Okay, we still can't figure out where it is. Going to do some more tests." And I remember sitting in my bed being like, "Okay." you for so many years worked on like your mental power and even like competing like you're always working on like the power of the mind and like controlling your mind and I literally sat there in bed and I wrote like wrote these affirmations for like an hour just wrote it down 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 because I was really defeated by that point like mentally really defeated I was like kind of like giving up point Mm. and I was like no Laura like you there's the only one person now that can fit like fix this and like make it better and it's like it's you like these doctors are doing everything and nothing's helping and I don't know if it's coincidence or like whatever, but that afternoon they came back and they're like, okay, we found where the infection's from. And I was out of hospital like three days later, which- And where was it coming from? It was, so I had um, like ovarian cysts, which are yeah. super common in women. Like, yeah. I think- Sorry, I'm, I'm saying yes, only because I went out with a girl that had ovarian cysts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're really common. They're not like an issue. But how was it, that they were bleeding? Or no, they? so one of them got infected yeah. um, just from being really run down was basically what it is. And yeah. I- they also, said, you said earlier, and I'm changing what, lifestyle. But also, you said earlier that at a certain point you didn't have a period for like f- four years yeah. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did that have an effect? Um, no, they said that it wasn't like it wasn't really a thing. I mean, they'd always kind of like. Did you fled. worry that there was a connection between your bulimia? Oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and the yeah, fact yeah, yeah. That You hadn't had periods, and then these cysts occurring. Well, they did a lot of like they did a, some checks as well, like in turn, just to, like make sure, sure like there was nothing like lasting maybe from the bulimia mm. or like whatever. Like just they did like a whole body like kind of scan. Um, but yeah, no, literally one of the cysts got infected and became in the space of. So when they found it, it was three centimeters. That's big. Yeah. And then in the space, so they then started with the right antibiotic for this. They found out what it was. It's treated me for two days and nothing was working. You know, I was like, had them being pumped into my arm. Nothing was working. Wasn't like fighting it. I was getting worse. So they checked the abscess again and it had grown to nine centimeters. So then I went into, yeah, well, yeah, it's like that. Um, so it had grown like in, in three days, like well pretty big yeah. um and then they're like okay we're happy to have an operation i was like yeah now like i want to go like right now just to do it and they're like okay well we can either put you to sleep i was like honestly i don't even need any painkillers like just get this sh- out i like, don't it. even care yeah. um and yeah honestly those guys are incredible that night i was feeling like pretty much sweet well not sweet i was it took me a good six months to get <laughs> well, better I mean, but, but i was feeling is, is that the national was, health looked after you pretty pretty good yeah, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Really, really, really well. No, so one of the, the greatest institutions in the United Kingdom, I would suggest. Definitely. Yeah, a lot of others. So there's you. What's happening now? Um, well, like I said before, trying to... Uh, Got a YouTube channel? Yeah, so YouTube is underway. Hopefully, How easy is that? It's not that easy, mate. I will tell you that Do right you know now. What? Yeah. My organisation skills, my team and manager, my mum, my manager will all tell you I am so She's, bad. <laughs> Well, what are you so bad at? I mean, I just find it absolutely confusing. To be yeah, me with too. You. Me too. But I some people like, don't. My life was so people simple. People like Jamal Edwards find it very, very easy and understandable. Yeah. They can deconstruct it very, very clearly. So for me, it's like a passion project. It's mental health and fitness, two things that I'm really, really passionate about. Mm-hmm. And kind of putting them together and I'm getting other um, people on to chat about how fitness has implemented them in their mental health. Um in positive and negative. Yeah. I can, I want to, I think I listen to so many things where they speak about mental health and I just think it sounds sometimes so like no light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. And I'd like to do something that just seem, you know, gives a, it gives like a way out, you know, and like this is, you know, I struggle with this and this was how I got out, you know, like there's a solution. 
um, rather than be like, oh, this is my story and it was really, really sad and kind of um, like just, yeah. Because I'm going to tell you my surf story. Because <laughs> when I was a kid, we used to go on holiday to Pembrokeshire, which is... My mum's from there. Is she? Yeah. It's a great little, great place. We used to go to a place called Broadhaven and Little Haven. Really good. And they had what were known, well, it was a bit of two-ply. You know what two-ply is? It's a bit yeah, wood. Uh, yeah. And it curled at the end and they called themselves, they were boogie boards yeah, before yeah, boogie yeah, boards yeah, were invented. Yeah, yeah. They were actually like just old it's, school it's ones. a plank of wood, <laughs> yeah. right? How on earth are you? And you literally could, if you picked the right way, I mean, you literally, you waited and it, oh God, it was freezing. There were no wetsuits yeah. and anything like that. But Mate, it was just fantastic fun. And I've always wanted to surf. And so my dad spoke to a local guy who had some surfboards. And so they came along. I mean, literally with these Bismarcks, these really long boards, <laughs> right? And we were in the shallows and my brother decided to stand up on it. And as he stood up on it, it went underneath him right into the back of my head. And I still have a scar behind my Oh, my head. God, you got surf injuries. God. Man, I'm ah, surf don't worry about me. <laughs> Charlie, don't surf. Get camp surfs. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, he knocked me under the wall and literally knocked me out, actually. It was a good shot. I know he'd been waiting to get his own back for some time, and I swear to this day he did it on purpose. But um, <laughs> my surf injury. But can you learn the age? Yes, 100%. Old farts can surf? Yeah. It really? depends how much you want it. Oh, yeah, I, th I do want it. I just don't want to do it in like, well, no disrespect, I'd go to Nuki to look at the waves. Oh, and God, no, go don't to do it there. Nice, nice hotels and like drink nice I, red um, wine and look out at the ocean. But I see people, I see I see old kids like myself going out there going, yeah, man, this is going to be easy. And you just see them drowning, you know. I you think that them, surfing is a massive Not literally drowning, egos. but you just see them like sitting on the end of a board for like, you know, watch. I'm just waiting for the right way to come. <laughs> no, mate, you haven't got a clue what you're doing. Just get off the board, go into the bar, dry off, have a pint of old fart tail, open a pack of salt vinegar crisps. I think though a massive part of it yep. is the floating around out there. It's just a place where it's always been safe for me when I struggled with school. It was like, okay, I'm just going to go surf and everything will be okay. Everything just goes. I think you have so many things to think about. You're paddling, you're in the ocean, you're lying on a surfboard, you're trying to catch a wave, get the wave, stand out for it, and then get back out. Mm. Like, you don't have time to think about all the other pointless things. Like that so how many on, times you know? would you stand up in a in a an afternoon, for instance, depends how perfect, what how much of a perfect wave you're waiting is. for. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, like fifteen times in an hour. That's because you're good. Yeah, but, but I mean, I mean, it depends. It but, depends. But, but once you get it, I mean, even I can remember going back to me on the little two ply plank. You know what? Once you got one and you went all the way yeah. to the beach, man. It's like, yeah, there's a big smile on the face. Yeah, no, right? well, that's thing. Like, you can't take anything away from that feeling of like no, doing no, it. No, no, and it's like being when... totally being it one yeah, with yeah, nature. Yeah. Like, it's like being your own kite, isn't it? It's yeah. like being lifted up by the wind. You know what I mean? It's been. We um we did a thing actually with some like war veterans that had, like, is it war veterans? Is that the right word? Like, yeah. Been to war. Yeah. Um, that had. Um. PTSD? Exactly. Yeah, Post traumatic stress disorder. So like, Sorry, it's like, an so area I that I know something like, about. About periods. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, PTSD. So they came down and we basically taught them to surf because this guy had done like a lot of studies on like how the mind works when you are surfing. And um, he was like, I think it could, I think it can cure it. So not cure it, but basically Help like give to, them something yeah. like else. A, it's to think exciting. Of. B, it's yeah, a yeah, challenge. Yeah. It's what service personnel would get exactly would get, so would get, it was they'd definitely of, get something out of it i would suggest yeah, yeah. But anyone can can't they yeah no if definitely they're into it. so we took them for an hour and there was one guy who he'd but he'd obviously like been through like hell and back um and his wife was on the beach and she was saying she was like i don't know how well this is going to go like if he's in the water and he has like some sort of like you know, mm, attack. Like, attack thing, then I'm not sure. I, we just need to make sure that he's like safe and stuff. So we, everyone was out there, like everybody was comfortable in the ocean enough to like kind of get him back in if so say anything had happened. And the guy literally was out there for four hours straight. He was like, I don't want to come. He don't, I don't want to come mm. in. Like he was so happy. Um, and his wife was like crying on the beach. And it uh, for, definitely for us that, you know, surfing is everything anyway, but to be able to share that with somebody and change their life, was so so sick. So there is a there is a chance of the surf school down the line. Oh, for sure. I love sharing my sport with other people. And it's nice to live by the ocean, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I could, I would. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh no, I for me, even living in London, I I've really struggled with it. Um, in the last year, I have to go away every like month, just for a week, 
to surf because otherwise my you brain do sound like you know what you, can, you do sound like you're living a very very nice life now can I just say that just, I have to go away oh no every, my life is I think incredible you say, I have to go away every year every every, no, every no, 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 no. I have to go away every month but it's it's more your air miles must be good not even really because I go to like Portugal yeah what's wrong with that great fish great yeah, wine yeah no it's my favourite place I, that's where I'll be back to so and you speak the language understand yeah. like everything um, yeah but yeah, that was like where I grew up, so that's that's home. Um, and is that and is that the long term future? Yeah, for sure. That's that's yeah, that's my home. <laughs> but being here is great. You know, the things that I'm doing at the moment is what I dreamt of like doing a year ago, and I'm now doing the things that I'm really passionate about. You know, like when I came out of Love Island, I had to kind of do all that like Love Island bit. Um, but now I'm You're doing the things that I'm things that you really, want. really passionate about. And I care about, you know, like even like having this chat with you is like so sick. And I'm like stoked to be here. But there's well, so many likewise. other things, you know, that I I want to do that I'm in this time of my life is like the perfect yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. And, and I can be here You're 25 now. years old and you've already achieved quite a lot. And you've already on, been on been a bit of a journey already, haven't mm -hmm. you? But that is, you know, the man fantastic thing about life. For sure. I wouldn't change a thing. Like even, you know, the sepsis, the bulimia, the, you know, all the things, you know, because they, they came with so many like other amazing things. And I think the things that you learn but you've when learned you have from crazy them. highs and crazy lows is you learn how to get through them. You but know, they're all like, rungs on your ladder, aren't they? Yeah, for sure. No, I, I love like every single stage of it that I've had to go through. And I think yeah, I wouldn't be the same person without it. So it's not so, not so bad. <laughs> Definitely not so bad. And it's lovely meeting you. Lovely to meet you too.